Python versus orangutan. So what is that all about? So what I'm going to talk about today is, is kind of something I do on the side, but my day job is um, I work at Oxbotica, we're a spin out from the Oxford Mobile Robotics Group, and we work on uh, self-driving vehicles and, and mobile autonomy in general. Very fun stuff, very, lots of cool, exciting things going on, and something I'd like to talk about at some point, but maybe for a future edition. Um, on the side, I also organize the London Machine Learning Meetup, so I'm always looking for interesting people who are doing interesting stuff and cool stuff on the machine learning front. If you're ever in town, or even if you're not in town, uh, you think you're doing something interesting on the machine learning front, we can, you know, we can get you travel and things covered. Um, let me know. Um, I'm always looking for interesting people. Um, also on the side is, I don't live in a particularly fancy neighborhood, and not far from me there's a couple of parks, and there's a lot of litter lying, lying around. And for a long time, I've been bringing on this, and I've been looking to build kind of like a, a Wally, uh, a little litter robot that can go out and clean up the litter. Um, it's kind of parked at the moment because of this orangutan stuff, but that's also something I'm, I'm always thinking about, interested in. If people are doing stuff in this area, um, uh, yeah. And, and on the same kind of note, just to plug, um, also I'm working with um, with some with with some friends to kind of raise awareness around marine litter. So there's a lot of plastic in the oceans which get washed up on beaches. And so what we're doing is um, we're doing a trip around the UK uh, using collecting drone imagery of the beach of the of the strand line of the beaches. And then you can use some again you can use some machine learning to train um, in this case a convnet to identify plastics on the beach and that way you can map out uh, beaches at quite a large scale and all the data gets fed back into scientific research. It's a project with Imperial College London and also something you know we're looking to, to broaden out. Anyway back to the main topic. So who's this? Wally. What are you supposed to do with Wally? Find him. So where's Wally? I'll eat my hat if anybody can see him. <laughs> right in the middle. So yeah, we all know Wally. You get a cluttered picture, and you, you know there's somewhere he's hiding. And you go find him. So I got the same problem with orangutans. Where's the orangutan? Well, actually, there isn't an orangutan, but it's worth a good test. <laughs> <laughs> I failed to find a good picture. Um, right. So this is work um, I'm doing together. Well, for International Animal Rescue. So they're a large animal rescue charity. Um, they've got operations around the world, but in, in the UK, for example, it's a lot of work around whales, dolphins, seals, seagulls, etc. Um, but they also do a lot of work in ar uh, around orangutans. So they have, I think, there's two rescue centres in Indonesia. So these are places where. Um, oh, let me backtrack. But so orangutans are one of the five apes, and they're extremely intelligent um, and, and smart animals. And especially as babies, they look very cute. Um, so people like to keep them as pets, and there's, there's a whole illegal trade in, in these in these animals. But of course, while they look very cute as, when they're little, and actually they're they're a nightmare to work with when they're little. But anyway, so people take them in as pets, but then they get older, and, and in the end, they end up in a cage or tied to a to a post or or generally just abused. Um, or, you know, they, they would, their natural habitat is the rainforest, but there's a lot of palm oil plantations, um, and these, these plantations are growing, they're chopping down forests, these animals, you know, don't have a place to live anymore, they end up in the plantations, and so they get found, and, and essentially, they, in the end, they end up at a rescue center, if they're lucky. And so the point of the rescue center is you take these animals in, and you try to rehabilitate them, you try to patch them up as best you can, and hopefully, if they're not too old, or not too young, or not too traumatized, you can release them back into the wild. That's it kind of idea. So, and there's, there's a, I think there's maybe five or six of these large orangutan um, rescue organizations, and there's a very, there's a very well-known Dutch one, I think, Bos, Bosnian, no, Borneo orangutan sanctuary or something. But uh, anyway, I've been working with IAR, but the, the problem I'm going to talk about today is pervasive across all, all organizations. Right, so in particular, there's this post-release monitoring phase. So, okay, you ha you, you've taken in the animal, let's say you've patched it up and you've released it back into the wild. But if you look at how much money goes into um, rehabilitating one of these animals and how much money goes into running one of these centers, um, you want to know that when you put the animal back into the forest, does it survive? Does it live out for a week, two weeks, ten weeks, a month? You know, ideally, the, whole, the point of the whole release program is you release the animal back and it lives out a normal, natural, healthy lifespan, which can be up to 50 years. So, but how, how do you know that's actually working? How do you know the animal survives? So, what they essentially do is they have somebody follow 
each animal pretty much 24-7 and stay within line of sight of the animal. And they keep a, a very detailed logbook saying, okay, the animal's doing this, it's eating, it's up in the tree or whatever. And they follow the animal pretty much 24-7 for the first two, two, three months. And then let's say the animal's doing all right, then it kind of tapers off to once a week, once every two weeks, etc. So, well, first of all, this is extremely manual intensive. Um, as, you know, you don't really realize that until you're you know, up to your knees in the mud and you, you know, mosquitoes around your head trying to st you know, keep track of some, some ape that's going through the trees. Um, but also, let's say you haven't seen the animal for, for a week or two. Where do you start looking? Where, where on earth is the animal? Now, orangutans make nests, so something I didn't know, but every night they go up in a tree and they build a nest. And so they sleep there. So you, you know, what you can do is you go to the last known nesting site and you can start looking around there. But still, it's, it's a needle in the haystack. Now, of course, people say, well, okay, we've got animal tracking technology, right? You've got you just a little, little chip or, or, or a collar or something, and then you can figure out where the animal is. True, but orangutans are a particularly special case. So you try to put, well, the typical thing is like a collar. So you put like a, a collar around the neck. Now, first of all, the, the males have these cheek pads, and it would inter the collar would interfere with that and the way they... Um, and the, the way they seduce their females, etc. So, no, collars, no, um, not allowed. Uh, and also, you know, they'd be very easy to slip off anyway. Um, so you'd think maybe like a bracelet or, or an anklet, but then the orangutans have like got very flexible joints, so it'd be easy to slide off. And also, they're very clever, they're very strong, so that anything you attach through them, they start biting and chewing and pulling, or they get somebody else to bite and chew or pull at it. Um, so, not saying it's impossible, but it's very tricky. And also, what you don't want to do is you, wanna, you don't want to like, say you manage to get on a collar, um, but then the battery runs out. What you don't want to do is you want to catch the animal again to replace a battery. Or, you know, the animal is going to gain weight, it's going to lose weight, so how do you have something that adapts? Again, not obvious. So, what the kind of solution is people use now are implants. So, you, a little implant about the size, in the UK I would say about the size of a one pound coin, but doesn't really mean anything here, but let's say it's the size of a two euro piece, but about a centimeter thick. It goes in the back of the neck, because they've got this, this fatty patch there. And this implant came out of a collaboration with a, an Austrian university, and this sends out a pulse, a ping, every two seconds, at a specific frequency. There's no modulation, there's no data or anything, it's just literally an on-off pulse. And every animal has a different frequency, and that's how you can tell between them. So, okay, you have a pulse, you, you have this ping. Now, if you're in the jungle, you've got a big antenna, and then you put on some headphones, and then you can wave the antenna around, trying to listen where the ping comes from. And that will give you around 200 meters range. So that's better than line of sight, but 200 meters in, in a dense jungle is not much. So even, you know, if you haven't seen the, the animal again for two weeks, you have to go essentially go whacking your way through the bush, pretty much random search, until you hopefully end up in this 200 meter bubble around the animal. So a lot of, lot of time is wasted here. So yeah, as you can see, you know, this is what you're, you're working your way uh, through. But of course the idea is, can we do this from the air? And so this is the problem that ended up on my desk, I think almost, almost two years ago now. Um, so the idea is, can we have a drone that can take off, fly above the forest, has a suitable payload that can listen for these pings, and then, because the drone knows where it is, there's GPS, you're up in the air, you've got plenty of satellites, so then the drone knows where it is, it listens for, the, you can pick up the ping, and then it'll come back to land, and you can get kind of a heat map that tells you, okay, the animal is there. That's the idea. Make sense? Right, so that was the, the problem that arrived on my desk, and so can, can we do this? Now, first of all, just a reality check, because people often get carried away. And there's one thing, techno you know, we're all technologists here, and technologists like to masturbate with technology. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. But no, people get carried away. Um, I once did a talk about this um, at some, some, some drone event, and the lady pro promoing this talk, she, she, she wrote like an article, you know, an interview. And it was like, drones going to save orangutans from extinction kind of thing. It's ridiculous. Of course they're not. Um, so all we're doing here with the drone is we're turning a needle into a haystack, needle in a haystack problem into a needle in a bale problem. You know, we still got to fly, you know, up and down, try to search this thing, but we can do it a lot more efficiently. But it's not going to solve the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is people are chopping down the rainforest and these animals ending up in sanctuaries. Drones are not going to help that. Okay, you can use them for mapping and, and mapping the, the habitat destruction, but these things are complex. They're social, political, even religious issues that tie into this. Um, they're not going to save orangutans from extinction, unfortunately. But um, it is, for the, this specific case, it makes sense to use them. 
what we really want to do is we want to have better implants or be better tracking technology so ideally we can we can track them remotely much more easily but that doesn't really exist yet and i'm always looking for people with ideas here um, so the core problem is really habitat destruction and it's pretty complex and it's, it's pretty depressing um, but that's just kind of a, a reality check um, but that's not to say they they have their place Right, anyway, so the idea was let's start very simple. So pre-programmed flight path and we just map signal strength um, or, or in, in space. So the idea being you, define, you come up with your flight path and you just do, you know, lawnmower type pattern up, down, up, down, and down. You cover an area and then you land and then you can generate this kind of heat map and you say, okay, well, there's three, uh, three or four animals there and that's where roughly where they are. We don't need to know the position in, you know, up to 10 centimeters accurate. It's already good enough if you know up to 50 meters, you know, even 100 meters radius. So we don't have to be very precise. Um, they just want to know, you know, where is the animal roughly? Has it been moving? We can do this by multiple flights. And they'll always want to go check up on an, annual, uh, on an animal manually anyway, because they would just always want kind of a visual check to see how the animal is. So, you know, pros of this is simple. It's, you can easily accommodate multiple animals and, you, you know, it's, it's fairly quote unquote easy to put this together. Um, the disadvantages is not very efficient. You can imagine if anybody anybody here working with radio knows a lot about RF or oh, I, I can say what I want then I guess. <laughs> but no, so you could imagine you know somebody who knows a bit about radio they go well hang on why are we doing this up and down? We can just we should take off. We use two antennas. Or we have some kind of directional system, and we take off and we we rotate 360 degrees. We we locate where the signal is the strongest and we go straight at it. You can kind of do kind of like a gradient descent, um, you know, in terms. To get your optimum and sure you can come up with something like that but you still have to build it and operate it in the jungle etc and there's a lot more failure modes and things get complex and if there's anything i learned from this is complexity is not good <laughs> um, so but you know let's let's start simple so what i started with was you know a fair a fairly standard you know nothing particularly fancy off the shelf uh, dev uh, uh, dev drone should we say there's lots of mounting points and easy easy to access and thing uh using a pixhawk autopilot um anybody fly fly any drones here really no one <sighs> ah vincent kind of no it's you know uh these things are very fun to play with they're very easy to get into um it's not very expensive at all um, and, you know, like a Pixhawk, so that's the little thing there, that's the autopilot, that's an open source autopilot. You, all the code is there, it's got nice Python APIs, you can, you know, you, you can really toy with this. If you're a programmer, there's lots of very fun stuff you can do with not little money, all you just need is a bit of creativity. Definitely worth checking out. So anyway, so we have our Pixhawk that, that controls the drone, so that will, you know, make, it has gyros and accelerometers, etc., to make sure the drone's stable and it can do waypoint following if you plug in a GPS, etc., etc. So that's the drone. Then we need um, a ra some kind of payload. So we've got these, these implants here at the bottom. So those are the things that are generating the ping. Then we need an antenna to actually receive the analog signal. And then we need a radio that turns the analog signal into a digital set of samples. And those, those digital samples then plug into a little single board computer. So think of this as a, a raspberry, in this case, it's not a Raspberry Pi, but you know, same kind of thing, it's just more powerful. And then on, on top of that, we just run Python, and then we have a web front end sitting on, on, on top of that. So that's kind of every, how everything plugs together. Uh, and again, you know, people who know a lot about signal processing and electronics, you could debate whether this is a good way of doing this, but that's a, I'm happy to have that debate, but that's a separate story. Um, so, and by the way, the radio at the top is just, in this case, just a USB dongle. is what we typically call a software-defined radio. So... Again, these are fun things. If you want to you know, receive a radio station on your laptop, let's say, you can buy one of these dongles, plug it in, and then you have essentially a digital stream of, of samples that you can tune to any frequency, and then you can demodulate your FM radio or transmit stuff. Or There's all kinds of things you can do. Anyway, so as for programming stack, so on the drone, uh, there's drone kit. Python, lovely Python API that you use to interface with the drone. You can tell it, take off land, go to this GPS position, fly at this altitude, turn around, whatever. Um, very nice. Um, and for this particular case, for this uh, SDR, so for this radio, this, again, there's a Python library which you can use. Um, then all the signal processing is just your standard scientific Python stack, multiprocessing, NumPy, etc. And then on the front end, I just did a little web front end with um, using Leaflet, React, etc. that I just talked to the back end. Nothing particularly, no, nothing particularly flashy. 
So the detection logic itself, so what you get in is from this radio is essentially a NumPy array of complex numbers, which represent your, your samples over time. And then there's, there's different, now there's many different ways you can approach this. Um, and I've kind of changed it, kind of changed that in the current iteration, but essentially you're collecting samples and then you, what I was doing is you look in the frequency domain. So Fourier transforms, does that mean anything to anybody? A Fourier transform? Okay, oh good, so some nodding there. Um, so essentially, you, you do a Fourier transform, and you can look in. You look at the spectrum, and you can figure out was there a burst of energy at this particular frequency that corresponds to the implant. Um, but and that's useful. But I guess since this is essentially a time domain phenomenon, you have this pulse in time. Um, you should also look at this in the time domain. So then you can do things like cross correlations. Does that mean anything to people? You know, time series or people in the financial world will know this. So you know, you can do those kind of things on the signal as well. Um, all of this, so this is what's happening essentially. We, we, we listen for two seconds, and then we, we do some Fourier transforms, we do some time domain analysis, and then we have some heuristics to kind of figure out, okay, did I hear a pulse or didn't I? You're gonna have false positives, false negatives, it's not a hard science, but that, that's a separate problem. All of this happens completely offline on board on the drone. There's no communication with the base station. So, uh, and there's a kind of a web app you can use to interface it. So the way this works is you have the drone, you, you draw out your, your mission, so which area you're interested in. That will generate a flight plan, and then you hit, hit start, and this will start the, the loop going, and the drone will take off, it'll start flying, and in the air it'll be collecting samples, doing the processing and recording the results. And the drone comes back, um, it has its own Wi-Fi hotspot. Again, you just use your tablet or your phone to connect to the drone, and then you can just visualize the results on a map. So th that's the way the workflow works. Um, so you know, these are some kind of pictures that you get. So in this case, we collect a bunch of samples, and this is essentially the spectrum. So this is the output of your, uh, your DFT. Um, and we do some filtering and you, some cutoffs and things, and this kind of filtered signal. And this is something in the time domain, but ignore the bottom one. So, you know, you get a fairly noisy spectrum and uh, doesn't seem to be any, anything obvious going on. So that's where there's no pulse, but this is an example where there, there is a pulse. So you can see a definite, you know, burst of energy here in a certain part of the spectrum, which if you filter out, you see there's a definite peak there which stands out. So this is the case where, yes, we've detected a pulse. There was a, a pulse there. So in, in this case, you can very confidently say, okay, I, I know um, that this, this is definitely a real signal and you know at that point in time what your GPS location was, so that gives you uh, an approximation for the true location of the animal. Make sense? So, you know, we, the very first thing we did was proof of principle. So an off-the-shelf drone, this is an ins uh, DJI Inspire, a lovely, p a lovely drone for doing aerial fil uh, filming. And we just strapped a big Yagi antenna, this is the antenna they use in the bush, and then we put an implant somewhere, and we just kind of hovered it, and can we detect something? Um, the big worry was, because of the drone, you've got all these motors spinning, you've got, you know, in this case, you've got ultrasound going off, so there's a lot of going on. Is that going to create in electrical interference or radio interference that's going to interfere with the detection of the, this very weak signal? And um, so this, this, you know, it, it, it flew like a dog, but it, it kind of worked. Um, and then you look at the results and you, we plot, plot out this, this very, very basic little heat map thing. And okay, we, we could get some detections. It wasn't great, but it kind of proved the principle. Okay, yeah, I think we, we can do something here. Um, and then, you know, this, is, this was pretty much six to eight months of my life. Um, I live on the south coast of the UK, not far from a large um, um, nature sanctuary, should we say, or, or wildlife park. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time with my knees in the mud, in the cold, with the drone, and I would take the implant, I would go put it somewhere at a known location, and I'd, you know, fiddle with the software, fly, you know, fly, fly a grid, come back, look at the results, and then, you know, then I wouldn't detect something, I would, or we're wrong, or things would break, and, you know, iterate. So a lot, a lot of time was spent there. And I seen pretty much everything, everything go wrong. <laughs> um, so just to give you an idea of the workflow, um, so I put the drone, uh, put the transmitter in a known, known location, and then I would just uh, flick a switch, and the drone takes off um, by itself, goes to the specified altitude, and will start flying. So in the, in the beginning, you start very easy, 10 meters, so nice and low, quite nice and slow, and you just fly up and down, up and down, up and down, and then you know all the way up to 120 meters. This is from a camera on the drone. Um, so this is the legal limit you're allowed to fly in the UK. 
and this was also the highest I managed to get some, some detections. So I was pretty happy with this actually, 120 meters, pretty high, and that's more than good enough for what I need in Borneo. Uh, however, of course, this is, you know, this is South UK, it's not very representative of Borneo, first of all, there's no jungle. Um, <laughs> but okay, you know, start simple uh, and work your way, work yourself off. Um, okay, and then come back down to land. Uh, and I think, yeah, so these are the kind of plots I was getting. So this is just matplotlib running over some of the data that was generated. Um, and I can look at ground speed and altitude. So here, altitude, I was going 30 meters, roughly. And then there's various heuristics I use to kind of figure out, is there a pulse or not? And the star is the true location of the of the implant, because I know what that is, because I put it down, so I know the true location. And then the, the heat map is kind of my heuristics. And so what you'd want is like a big red blob around the star, because that's the true location. Uh, you know, uh, that kind of worked out. Again, the accuracy, well, uh, it doesn't have any units on here, but you're talking about, you know, I think in the order of 20, 30 meters or so, which is, which is fine. Oh. And then the, the same thing also. Yeah, so that was 25 meters. And then 40 meters, and then, you know, all the way up to 80 meters. And still, and this is 120 meters. So even here, there's only one true detection, but that, you know, still within a, a 20, 30 range, meter range of the actual um, implant. So that was pretty good. So that's why I was happy with that. So then I packed up everything, and then, um, oh, no, off to, uh, off to Borneo. So this was uh, last, last spring. So they have their main site uh, in, um, in West Kalimantan. That's where they have the sanctuary and this, the, the animals come in first. And so uh, as soon as I arrived there, I started doing the exact same thing. So put the, put the implant somewhere you know, in, in the forest and then start flying. Now in this case, we had somebody else there who had a filming drone. And so this was, this was quite cool that we had one drone flying and filming the other drone doing its thing. It was a bit hard to kind of follow the drone. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great fun getting this to work. Um, but it's impressive. You look at the stability of the camera. You know, this is on a, on a platform. It's, it's a really impressive piece of kit. Um, so here, you know, I think, I don't know, about 50 meters or so. And here there was jungle. Still not the same pristine jungle as we'd see in the final release site, but much more representative. And this is where the nightmare began, because everything would just break. Um, I'd seen pretty much everything break before, but now suddenly it's 40 degrees, and my voltage regulator soon cooked itself. The computer was one degree away from cooking itself. Um, it, would, it would shut down at 100 degrees. It was constantly at like 98, 97. <laughs> uh, so then yeah, you try to get the sun away, and then the, the batteries, oh, it was just, just an absolute nightmare. Um, and then, of course, with the jungle, the sensitivity was a lot lower, so I had to fly lower, and I had to fly slower, which means endurance was lesser. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was a, a lot of frantic fiddling out there in, and trying to fig, fiddle with code, and there's no network, or there's very, you know, if you're very lucky, or there's this weird 3G signal. Um, anyway, but, so a lot of time was spent, but okay, progress was, was kind of made. Um, where is it? I, in the end, it's just same thing, come down to land again. Where is it, actually? Oh yeah, there it is. Um, so this is the pre, should we say the, the, the actual center? So that's where they have large cages and where they keep the animals and things. And there's also a section of the forest that they've kind of cordoned off, which is their pre-release site. So these are animals that they think are good enough to be released, but just to make sure you put them in a pre-release site just to kind of see how they behave. It's a fairly small area, but you, and you can track them very closely, and you can just kind of see how they do. And if you feel confident, then you move on to the actual release site. So this is where I started flying over this pre-release site. And um, fortunately, the, the implants I was using in the UK were actually a bit weaker than the ones they actually used uh, over in Borneo. So I was actually getting a stronger signal there than before. So that, that, was, uh, that compensated then for, for the other loss in altitude and sensitivity. So anyway, I started flying and uh, got some very good detection. So that was good. But the real... The real progress came um, when I did the first proper test, i.e. flying completely blind. So all I knew, there was an animal somewhere there. I didn't know where. Um, and then I would fly, you know, fly the pattern, come back, and then I would have to say, I think the animal is there. And then they would radio the guard who was actually with the animal, say, where are you? And the two locations had to match up. And uh, in this case, the results were really nice. You got, you got this very nice little 
hotspot there, and so that's where I thought the animal was, and that's where it turned out to be. And it's actually until then the charity was really quite skeptical about the whole thing. You know, there's some 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 weird guy in the UK using drones, and how is it going to solve their orangutan tracking problem? And you find, you know, rightfully so, conservation people are usually often quite cynical for various reasons and, and quite skeptical of technology as well because they've seen a lot of promises. Um, and they're conservatives as well. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> I don't know if the pun was intended, but okay. Um, but so that was kind of the first, the first case where okay, hang on, this this could actually work. This could actually be useful. So that was nice. Um, oh yeah. So th this is kind of a screenshot. The kind of I know, the interface is not great. I'm no UI person, but it is functional. So the idea is you 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 put in um, yeah, there's some radio parameters. Um, and then you, you can start, you can add a number of animals that you're detecting, you start flying, and, you, and these are the raw results, and you can render the results on a map. Right. So, okay, that kind of worked, and then we went off to the, the real release site. Um, and this was a very long journey uh, through mud and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, we got there in the end, and then after a few hours of trekking through the jungle, this is kind of their base camp, and then we do the same thing. And and the first thing I had when I arrived there was like, oh, hang on, where am I going to take off? Where am I going to land from? Because there's, as you can see, there's not many places. And this was the best spot found, just literally where the base camp was. And there's about five by, you know, five by five meters or so. Um, which, if you're standing there at the bottom, you think, okay, I need to take off here. It's, it's, you know, it's slightly nerve-wracking. Um, so in this case, uh, we had, again, we're just trying to verify this thing works now in an actual environment. So we, um, we knew there was an animal about two kilometers away, where, and there was, a, there was a, somebody following her. So like, okay, let's, let's go up to 100 meters, let's fly, dash out two kilometers, let's do a search, and then let's come back. Um, this or just making the flight plan for this turned out to be a pain, because I needed to know relative altitudes of the train around me, because I needed to set the height. Um, we had these, these fancy GPS receivers, but at the bottom of the canopy, there's no GPS reception. And they all disagreed, and the, um, the, the margins, you know, the errors were way off. So, kind of in the end, you just kind of had to guess um, and pick a number. And hopefully, it's not too high or too low. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then also, I was flying completely blind. I had, three, I, I had um, three systems in place for maintaining a communication link for the drone. All three of them failed for different reasons. So I had nothing. All I could do was take off, tell the drone to go. I see the drone disappear, and you just kind of cross your fingers and hope it comes back. <laughs> Literally. Um, so, and then, you know, you know the flight time is around, you know, 20 minutes tops. And so in this case, I was very happy when you're waiting there, like 15 minutes, and then suddenly you see the, you see the thing come, come back. Um, so that was great, and that was 100 meters. Uh, but then I had to take over manually to kind of land it again. And so this was pretty, pretty nerve-wracking as well. Um, and then uh, bring it down. So while I had no comms link with the, um, with the drone, the only thing, what I did have is just, there is a very basic radio signal that connects your, your transmitter with the drone. And all you know is it's connected or not. And that gives you a range of about a kilometer. That's, so all you know is, OK, it's roughly within a kilometer range. Um, And the plastic thing you can see, actually, that's the antenna that's stuck to the bottom. Yeah, so that was, that was, <laughs> that, that was a really <laughs> big sigh of relief, the thing landed again. So, okay, then very quickly, you know, hook up the laptop and, and start looking and, and downloading, <laughs> downloading the, the data. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we had no detections, nothing. So, like, oh, bugger. Um, but then again, it turned out the animal had moved somewhat. So, okay, maybe we got the area wrong. We were a bit too high anyway. And we, we got a bit optimistic, and they said, okay, let's lower the altitude somewhat. And, and so we get maybe a better signal. So, so we did that, and so changed the flight plan, changed the area a bit, lowered the altitude, and, and sent the whole thing off again. Um, and then it started flying about 15 minutes, the transmitter reconnects, and I say, oh, okay, roughly within kilometer range, and then, then suddenly went silent. There's nothing, and then you're like, like, okay, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and you're kind of looking around. And then uh, no drone. Um, <laughs> and then uh, post more, well, you know, it was 25 minutes, you're like, no, this thing is not coming back. 
Um, so it's like, okay, so what, what happened? Um, so then studying detailed maps and, you know, overlaying the flight plan, trying to understand what it might have done, etc. And then turns out what we, sh what we should have done is just lower the altitude at the place where we are searching, but not change the altitude where we dash out and dash back again. We lower the altitude everywhere. So on these, this two kilometer leg where we're going out, we, instead of 100 meters, we were now at, I don't know, 70 meters or so. It turned out that roughly a kilometer away, there's this big hill with some high trees, and probably on the way back, it clipped the tree, and then it got stuck in the tree somewhere. Uh, we tried to find it, but it's, it's, it's absolutely hopeless. So, okay. Um, I kind of was half expecting that was going to happen, so, you know, but it, it was a bit of a shame. But we did kind of prove the concept, so that was good. And then, a few literally two months ago, uh, I get an email saying, Dirk, we found the drone. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, so this is the picture they sent me. So the, the locals, they go out into the forest in, a lot, and I guess they, they, they saw something somewhere, and, and these are the bits and pieces they gather together. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't find the camera. I would have loved to see what was on the camera there. Um, but anyway, so I still have some bits and pieces. So anyway, so overall, I was very happy. It kind of proved the concept, et cetera. And so, but what I needed, I needed more sensitivity and uh, better drone and also some terrain following, et cetera. So this is kind of what I'm working on at the moment. So, well, okay, future lessons. The real world is hard. It is hard. Things break. Everything breaks. It's, it's um, you know, if you don't test it, it's, it's not going to work. Pretty much guaranteed. Um, simplicity and robustness over everything. Um, so as for phase two, better radio, better detection electronics, new upgraded drone, et cetera. And in parallel, looking at better uh, implants. So as to where I'm now, I've been doing a lot of work, again, all Python, um, comparing different radio settings and different sensitivities and trying to optimize um, the configuration. Um, I've also switched to using GNU radio. Is that, I guess if nobody's done any radio. Anybody know about GNU radio? Oh yeah, a couple people. I have to say, um, it's, it's, it's really good. It's, it's amazing. Um, it takes a bit of a while to wrap your head around how, how it works in the philosophy itself, but if you want to do something with radio, you want to process a radio stream, it has literally this kind of flowchart based approach and you drag and drop blocks and you connect them and it generates Python code or generates C++ code. Um, it's really nice. So I've kind of re-implemented uh, all my detection stuff uh, in GNU radio and that seems to be working a lot better. Um, there's still some performance issues I need to iron out, but so far that's, that's looking good. And I think I've kind of done the best I can do uh, now based on that approach. But it's definitely worth checking out. Um, so also I you know, built another drone. So this is um, what I've been testing with until very recently. Um, so again, I now have a proper payload box, whereas before everything was kind of strapped to the drone with Velcro and, and cable ties. Uh, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's... Uh, some amplification that's going on and some other things just to clean up the single and get me get me a cleaner signal. Um, so I've been testing that a lot, but then of course things break and things crash. And I, again, I got a bit optimistic. Uh, I was flying and there was a lot of wind and it was kind of the last, it was had been going fine, but just I needed to do one, one more flight. And I was up about 50, 60 meters and I suddenly, uh, you could see some rain coming in and then the rain would sweep through. And then just, you know, within five or six seconds, the, the drone stopped wobbling and then it turned upside down and then just <laughs> hit the ground. Um, so luckily it's not so bad, so I can fix it. Um, uh, so this was literally a few weeks ago. Luckily I have another drone. Uh, <laughs> so this is a, a Team Black Sheep system. It's actually, it's a very nice piece of kit. Um, it's a long endurance um, drone. And so that's what I'm strapping the, the payload to now. And this is going to be my, my last development uh, platform. So if this kind of works out, then I'll be built, looking to build the final system, which either will be a multi-rotor, but ideally I'd like a hybrid fixed wing to give me more endurance, but well, we'll have to see. And so the aim is to take this back to Borneo end of May, early, early June probably. And that's the plan. Anyway, so just to fully wrap up, I hope I haven't gone over time too much, but I just close with, with this. So. While I was down there, you meet a lot of people who work in conservation, and this is just one quote one of them said that stuck with me. So Leo Biddle, he, he runs one of the other sanctuaries in, uh, in Sumatra. Uh, they do a lot more than orangutans, they're much larger, but they, you know, they do a lot of work, but, um, and he's a great guy, but he kind of, we were talking about conservation, etc., why they do what they do, etc., and his quote was, conservation is creating hope where there is none. And it was really quite depressing. He said, look, you know, you, you cannot, it's very depressing if you look at how forest is disappearing, how, how 
all these cultural, political issues, etc. And you know, you just try to do what you do, and you try to create the hope there is. But it's it's kind of almost a uh, it looks like a battle you can't win. But you know, you need to you need to keep fighting. Um, so that that was very humbling, and makes you you think quite a bit and see how how everybody can kind of pitch in. But anyway. I'll close on that. And just to say, you know, I'm, this is kind of an open project with people interesting to help out. I know Vincent has been awesome in sending me some stuff, which I, I will get through. Um, but, you know, anything from web development to particularly people on the RF um, electronic side, but that's probably not the audience here. Uh, but yeah, no, any questions or thoughts or whatever, let me know. Cheers.